I spent close to half a month recreating the home of a character from my childhood. Clearly not satisfied with their legacy ending two years ago, I properly built their museum. I've been incredibly meticulous with this project, making sure I copied my initial design as accurately as possible while adding far more interactivity than required. And now it's open to the public, so in true game modding pain fashion, let me take you on a tour of the Ray Sudamemo Museum in Tower Unite. Just through this curtain is... Wait, did he just die? Well, sh**. What are we gonna do now? Welcome back to That New Condo. I'm your host, Jeff. Suspended in a separate plane of existence, this slice of history is filled to the brim with facts to learn, machinery to tamper with, and profits galore. We start our journey in the parking lot, where we have several cars lined up to inflate perceived attendance numbers, complete with the courtesy pair of headlights to direct people down the right path, provided you can afford all that petrol. The museum itself is a massive building that comes with a loading dock on the back side, and access to the roof by ladder, where you can spend much needed time figuring out why your solar panels serve no purpose. Moving inside the museum, you'll find the entrance area Area, where you'll spend all your work days sitting on this chair as you watch the profits roll in. There's also a desk in the corner for your underpaid assistant who will be doing all the work. And a maintenance area where you'll find your conveniently lever-controlled fuse box. Okay, shut off the footage now. Shut off the footage! Let's now make our way into the first exhibit room. This is the heart of the museum, with flip notes stacked all over the walls as if they're modern art. Each theme section comes with a book disguised as a plaque that you can read if you genuinely care about the main subject of this place. And you'll find a massive screen on the far end of the room where you can watch the full compilation of animations, a whole one hour and 17 minutes of them. The next room is a long homage to many of the subject's friends that you don't know or care about, and opposite that is a small area going over each of the footnote series, and why they're not just copies of their source material. An entrance to the medals exhibit can be found further back, but nobody will be headed there today, or any day. Why spend any effort remaking what was stolen when you can keep the exhibit closed and charge the same fee? The last room of note is home to the most disappointing attempt to kill anybody in all of history. You and your museum goers will be able to step inside the cryogenic chamber to see with your own eyes what it was like for the subject during what was meant to be, but definitely couldn't be, his final moments. All of these exhibits are wrapped up in and handled by simple automated systems that will probably break, but the attendants could deal with that themselves. With all this beauty yours to command, you'll be wondering why cash payments aren't accepted here, and you'll probably go bankrupt. Well, our time's up yet again. Next time on That New Condo, we'll pay a visit to a recreation of Crazy Taxi made in entirely in the Doom Engine. Until next time. Whoa, hold on, hold on, man. Next time doesn't happen until the end of my videos. You hear me? Oh, it's just a recording and I'm not dead. That's good, I suppose. Whatever. Let's get to the part of this you're actually looking forward to. Context. This is yet another video in a series I've been making called Game Modding Pain, where I describe the torture I put myself through to create mods for video games with restrictive modding tools, or for comedic effect. Today's game of choice is Tower Unite, and it requires a detailed explanation because it goes far beyond on the scope of this video. Made by the creators of Gmon Tower from Gary's Mod, Tower Unite is a social and creative experience bundled into one. The plaza is a place where people congregate to play bowling, gamble at the casino, go to the arcade, watch movies, or just explore on their own. The game worlds are separate from the plaza, and it's here players earn the most money by battling in various mini games, including mini golf, a top-down zombie shooter, a marble roller game, and a kart racer. Finally, there are condos, which are isolated worlds that players can build in using their in-game cash and it's this section of the game we'll be looking at today, as I poured hours into the construction of my condo to turn it into my childhood character's museum. And although I really want to jump into describing my building process and all the ways Tower Unite wronged me, I need to give you some context on the character as well, just so you're all up to speed. So apologies for adding even more runtime to this video. This is Race the Hedgehog, and yes, he is a Sonic OC, and a bad one at that. I created him sometime before 2009, but it was in that year that he would make his true debut on the internet as a fixture of Flipnote Hatena, a social network for animators that use the Nintendo DSi. I would later try to bury him in 2011 before ultimately giving in to my impulses and revealing him to my current audience in 2022. There's a lot more to this character and how terrible he is that I don't have time to cover in this video, so if you're truly interested in learning about him or just want to see some videos about the DSi, which happen to be some of my best work, I have a full Nintendo DSi movie on my channel you can
you can watch after this video. But essentially, Race's story was wrapped up with him becoming the curator of his own museum on Pseudo Memo, and I made an animation to commemorate that occasion. It is that animation that essentially acts as the floor plan for the museum's construction, as it contains several depictions of the interior and exterior. So I was already in the condo zone, fully ready to build what was only a film set until now. But this wouldn't be a game modding pain video without some agony. So let's finally get into what it was like to create this world. The first room I worked on was the entrance, since it's the one that appears the most in the animation and the only one shown from multiple angles. I knew that I wouldn't be able to use the default floor as the starting platform, but if you remove it, players that load in will fall through the world and have to suicide to respawn. Instead, I chose to create new platforms above the spawn. Canvas walls ended up being my most used item, as practically every flat floor, ceiling, or wall you come across is comprised of them. That doesn't mean I enjoyed working with them. I've always had an inkling that this style of level editor is difficult to work with, as I found I was having a very similar problem to what I was experiencing in Slipgate's level editor. The origins of canvas walls are at their bottom center, which would be fine if they were completely two-dimensional, but they have an aggravatingly small amount of thickness. That means that the rooms you create are ever so slightly smaller than you expect along every axis, and that throws off any attempts to keep objects aligned by position or size. It seemed like with every other object I moved into position, I had to manually specify they were 2.5 units off the ground. As for the walls themselves, keeping their scale at an integer would create these small gaps at every outside corner, so I would need to slightly increase their length just so that these could be sealed. And it was even harder when I had to combine them with lowered ceilings. All of the other objects here were relatively straightforward to put together, albeit time consuming, mostly consisting of me finding a good looking object in the Tower Express store and then carefully specifying its coordinates so it looked just right. The next room for me to work on was the main exhibit, and to do that, I would first need to put up pictures of the flip notes. I laid out all the animation thumbnails as canvases and ordered them into specific categories, the best from each eventually making their way into the museum. You can see them on the floor in this early screenshot I took, which is what they looked like before being hung up. This room was also where I got much acquainted with the archaic snapping system because of these velvet ropes and canvas wedges. In general, snapping in Tower Unite was mostly unhelpful and forced me to manually adjust object coordinates after the fact. Why? Well, while position, rotation, and scale have a precision of two decimal places, snapping does not allow decimal numbers, so any fine adjustments you've made will immediately be lost if you move an object while snapping. Of course, you also have to memorize what snap size you're using for each kind of object, as not getting the snapping right means you'll have to fix your own mistakes. There's no undoing as far as I can see, so you've got to be very precise or suffer the consequences. After dealing with all that, this room happened to be the one I fully closed up the first, which meant it was my introduction to condo lighting as well. It took a little bit too long to figure out the optimal models, intensity, radius, and cone shape for each light, but I managed and it looked good enough from the inside. There was no way this could have lasting consequences on the rest of the condo. Either way, the main exhibit room was the hardest thing I would put together because I was so new to condo building and had nothing to base my construction on. Once it was complete, I was much more comfortable with working on the characters and series exhibits, the walled off medals exhibit, and room A2. It definitely helped that I had no reason to fully build the medals exhibit, as Race's medals were canonically stolen by Pseudo Fox in the animation. Since these rooms weren't much of a hassle, I think now is a good time to go through some of the miscellaneous issues I experienced with Tower Unite condos, starting with the main menu. How condos work is that you buy a condo type from the realtor and then access one build of each type from the condo menu. This is rather silly for someone like me, because why would I want to build in anything other than smooth dirt? It would have been better if these were slots for which you chose what type you want them to be. Instead, we have to make use of snapshots, which are better than nothing, I suppose. And can I take a moment to rant about these velvet ropes again? These were the most difficult objects for me to line up because they're so thin that depending on the direction you look at them, they can appear aligned or misaligned on a whim. I can't remember the number of times I thought they were in place and then saw their metal hooks going inside each other. If I could switch to an orthographic view while moving these ropes, I would be able to get them and many other objects in line far more easily. Okay, back to the task at hand. I now had a full circle of the museum's interior complete and feeling so confident at this stage, I wanted to add more interactivity to the world. So I decided to create a maintenance area accessible from the entrance, though it requires you to know the code to enter. Inside, I put a fuse box that will control all the lights of the various rooms, plus some more stuff that I'm not going to spoil in this video. I want there to be some mystery so you explore this condo for yourself. Setting up these levers was a test of my proficiency in Tower Unite's input-output system, which is similar to Hammer's IO in a way that helped me figure things out quickly, but too simple to the point that it made using it difficult. So here's a whole bunch of 
IO complaints I have. Firstly, why are actions sorted this way, even in the search? I'm not able to change their order no matter what I try, and I don't want to add artificial delay. They're probably sorted by distance, but wouldn't it be better to sort them by name since I already use names to differentiate them? As for the triggering objects themselves, I learned late into construction that all levers are off by default. So if I wanted them to start on, I would have to rotate them into the on position and swap around their output so it looks like turning it on turns everything off and vice versa. Then there are some objects, such as invisible player blockers, that have activate and deactivate inputs, which you think would make them stop working, but no, you have to use hide and unhide. So why do we need the first two? And finally, I'm a bit disappointed that I can't remotely control a media player, but it's not too big a deal, as I know how annoying it could be to spawn into a condo and be forced to load a hundred or so media players. That's a lag attack waiting to happen. Once I had enough of a maintenance area done, I finally got started on building the exterior, the front of which had already been designed. Turns out it's way taller than it needs to be, but that's the fault of 2022 me. With the freedom to build outdoors, I went completely off the rails, creating a dirt path, a road box, plus a parking lot with working car headlights, a loading dock, a ladder up to the roof, street lights, and a generator. In total, too much for what this project called for. Working at this scale was a little more enjoyable than the interior design phase, but I was getting tired of entering massive position and scale numbers after a while. With the exterior coming together though, I was able to set the weather to exactly what I wanted and fiddle with the sky volume to improve the visible conditions. The biggest hurdles I had out here were the trees and road lines. For some reason, the position of a tree dictates its color, which I absolutely hate, especially because I'm colorblind. I don't even know if I fixed the problem, but regardless, I'm not touching these trees again out of fear of messing up their colors. As for the road lines, they, as well as the arrows in the museum, are made out of canvas decals. The main problem with these is that there's no way to attach them to a specific object or make them display only from a certain direction. So they can bleed onto other objects, which is best demonstrated by holding a physics object over the top of the road lines. I can't do anything about this, and I'm not even going to try. It was already hard enough to get them into position. And with that, the museum was not finished. Ha, <laughs> I always get you when you least expect it. Remember when I said that lighting was not going to cause any problems in the future? That was a blatant lie. Because although every light has an option for casting shadows, I have not seen a single shadow cast by an artificial light source onto a dynamic object in a condo. Not a single one. This means that any light source with a high radius will bleed into other rooms and ruin the otherwise realistic looking lighting. I had to check every single light source and make sure that there was no significant bleed so they wouldn't distract from the other lights. Though I didn't care enough to fix the bleed when you turn off lights using the fuse box. That would drive me properly insane. Some other things I obsessed over towards the end of this project were post-processing, invisible walls, and ambient sounds. I was sincerely hoping I could use post-processing to make the world look even better, but because I was using an effect for the cryo chamber in room A2, I couldn't. For some reason, you can't stack or switch between post-processing effects that are inside each other or have different scopes. I guess it truly doesn't matter at the end of the day, as post-processing is probably too much for a silly recreation of a building owned by a character from my childhood. Now the museum is well and truly done, and like I said at the beginning of this video, it is open to the public. If you have Tower Unite, you can subscribe to the museum on the Steam Workshop and play through it yourself, alone or with friends or strangers. If you don't own the game, take this video as my personal recommendation that it is totally worth the money. I've hidden 10 physics items throughout the world, and I want to see if you're able to find all of them. The key to this is the maintenance area. If you don't explore it thoroughly enough, you won't be able to find all 10. Of course, you may encounter the problem where physics items can't be picked up or disappear after being thrown, because for a game with as much potential as this, there's only so long it can go on without a bug appearing. For now though, I think I've done enough troubleshooting and I'm calling it quits. If you want to see me make more content like this, be sure to leave a comment below, and don't forget to like and subscribe so I don't die again. Special thanks to my Discord members who helped me film that intro, of whom you should join. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, I will see you all next time.